So, our distinguished panel. <laughs> Look at them. <laughs> we have, of course, Campbell Wilson, a man who, you know, he went from Singapore Airlines to Air India. Can you imagine the, the, the shock <laughs> that put him in therapy for the foreseeable future from the, rich, from the delights of that? Yvonne is with us. Are you ready, Yvonne? I, I'm always ready. <laughs> you're going to do the. Do you're, you're ready to now start cooperating more with Akbar and Qatar. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. We've always been ready, and uh, we're good to go. This is going to be fun to watch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Greg, stand up. <laughs> Whatever you ask, Richard. All right. What do we think he weighs? <laughs> I knew that was coming. I knew you did. Yeah. <laughs> and I d <laughs> but I gave it you anyway. Yeah, I know you did. But have a seat. Um, those of you who don't know, of course, Greg is, Greg's airline is now involved in a massive um, research effort, would you say? We'll talk about that. And, and John from Atlas. John, uh, you're retiring. I am retiring. Two weeks from yesterday or so. Two yeah. weeks. Yeah. So we have a CEO who can be brutally honest <laughs> because in two weeks he's out. <laughs> that is our panel. I want to start with you, John. Sure. Um, cargo was the life saver in a sense of the industry. And I saw in uh, Dr. Marianne's view uh, the, the numbers that are down. But it's also a conflict of the supply chain issues because you're moving stuff within the economy. So you have a really good view of what's happening in the economy, don't you? I think we do. Uh, you know, we're certainly in an area of defining what the new normal may be. We've gone from the tremendous opportunity that was presented to us during COVID and now things have, as was mentioned earlier, eased considerably. But yet, you know, demand when you compare it to the pre-COVID period is still quite strong. Um, rates have held, but not nearly at the levels that it was during COVID for sure. Okay, so we couldn't, I mean, that, that it's reasonable to expect that the rates would have come down, or at least the demand, because clearly there's just different ways of tra transferring. But I'm interested that the rates have held up. And not at COVID levels, but no, certainly but higher than what was pre-COVID. Right. Yeah. What's, what's driving that? I, you know, I think it's um, a recognition of the value that air freight brings to the market, the speed, the reliability, uh, the security, uh, the flexibility. Uh, we, one of the prior discussions we're talking about onshoring, nearshoring, wherever the freight may move or be produced from, air freight can answer that call. So as a result, and because of the need to speed to market, I think that's played a major role in uh, keeping some of the rates stronger than they were pre-pandemic. Do you see things moving by freight, that, by air freight that didn't move before, that have held, you've held a market on that? Um, certainly in some areas, yeah. not in all areas where ocean freight has now come back. Um, but, you know, I think this is an opportunity to, for manufacturers particularly to rethink their strategies. Um, you know, you talk about AI and big data and so forth. Are there strategies to leverage air freight, even though it may cost a little more, but not produce as much product, get it to market quickly? So those are some of the things we're seeing. We're People seeing are playing around with different strategies. That's right. That's right. This idea of the supply chain issues, or, I mean, uh, our last guest, Alan Vitti, didn't, didn't like that phrase. Where are you seeing it particularly, Greg? Uh, particularly in spares for aircraft, to be honest, Richard. Um, you know, I'm reasonably new to the industry, and, and hearing this term robberies mm -hmm. uh, coming from retail was quite interesting. I, it took me a while to work out what was going on. But you know, as, as recently as a few months ago, we ended up taking delivery of some brand new A321s for our domestic business. And literally within you know, the, a few minutes of them landing, we were taking parts off those planes in order to keep some other ones operational whilst we did our final checks before we got the new ones on. So 
we keep a close watch on exactly how many parts we're robbing off a plane to go and put on another. And they're running about double what they were um, traditionally. And it's uh, across the entire supply chain. All right, so is this a case of the, the new is more difficult to maintain than the old, more complicated or whatever, or is it just simply that you haven't got the parts? That is, I mean, I'm sure, because I'm sure what Greg's seeing, you're seeing as well. A absolutely, it's an it's a absence of new parts. Uh, I think that we're, we're noticing it most acutely uh, because we had 13 787s grounded uh, for many years as a consequence of Air India not having the funds to pay for spare parts and robbing aircraft to keep others flying. How do but you so have 13 planes <laughs> sitting on the ground costing you money because you haven't got a spare part? Well, that's a whole other question, but there were 30,000 spare parts that we needed to procure to get these aircraft up and running. How many? 30,000. <laughs> and that's not including anything to do with cabin interiors. When you discovered that, did you sort of, <laughs> you know, when somebody said, oh, uh, uh, Mr. Wilson, we need spare parts, 30,000 of them to be put. What did you say? What the? Oh, that, that was probably the fourth such thing that came across <laughs> my desk that morning. So it was just, okay, what else? <laughs> How angry are you? Because I'm sure you're having the same problem. Not, not as bad as <laughs> Campo, but uh, we, it's becoming a major issue, and especially for us, the smaller airlines. Uh, getting parts is becoming more and more difficult. Our AOGs are lasting longer, uh, and even when you get the parts, you get them at a premium as well. So the cost of uh, our operating costs shoot up as well. So th this is becoming a huge, huge challenge. If this had been in your previous existence, Greg, what would you have said? I mean, if it's a Walmart, you, you, you've been hearing that, well, we can't get the spare parts, and we can't get the this, and we can't get the that. I mean, what would you have said? Well, if I had 30,000 out of stocks in a <laughs> store, I probably wouldn't be in business. But um, I can tell you, Richard, I'm feeling pretty good. So thank you, Campbell. <laughs> I was running at 104, and I was worried about that. So 30,000 really makes me feel pretty good. <laughs> And what I would say is when those parts are ready, call Atlas and we'll be happy to <laughs> ship them quickly to you. So that's it. Right? You're not going to take the blame for not shipping them. I am not going to take that blame. All right. Yeah. What I'm not hearing from any, any of you, and this is because you're CEOs and you're moderate, is anger. I'm not hearing pissed off. I'm not hearing, don't look at me like that. <laughs> I know it's not going to get you the parts any quicker, but aren't you pissed off? In the case of restoring aircraft, I mean, it, it is what it is. But with respect to new deliveries and getting aircraft that should be operating, up and operating, very frustrated. Because there's a, a market opportunity that is smacking us in the face. And, and it is there for the taking. And to be sitting on assets and people and opportunities that are under tapped, very frustrating. You don't look like you're the sort of person that gets upset about much. Ask my wife. <laughs> um, you know, the reality is that there weren't too many industries that were harder hit than airlines during this period. Um, and it varies depending on what part of the country you're in. But in New Zealand, effectively, you know, we were shut down for over two years. And it just takes a while when you dismantle an industry to that effect to get on your feet. So, you know, it's, it's been an interesting period, hasn't it? It's almost like, like three phases, you know, period one, survive COVID, tick. Period two that we're sort of in at the moment is enjoy the recovery. And it is an enjoyable time because at the moment, you know, demand exceeds supply, you can pretty much sell everything you've got, we'd all like to have more, profits are back, it's good. Act three is coming our way pretty quickly, and that's an interesting position because, you know, we're seeing inflation, we're seeing cost associated with that, a drop in productivity, you could say stagflation. So it's going to be quite a challenging period, this next period, for us all to navigate. When you saw the numbers this morning on the profit, that 10 billion, 9, 10 billion, but one point whatever it is, 
percent. Now, I, I, I realize that's industry-wide. Some are making margins of nine, ten percent. Others are making no margins whatsoever. But to get this industry back to sustainable uh, profitability with a re with a decent return on capital and equity, how difficult is that going to be? I think it's always been difficult for the industry. Uh, historically, the industry hasn't returned its cost of capital. Uh, and I think this is maybe the best of times. We've got still a relatively constrained supply environment. We've got declining fuel prices. We've got yields and loads still quite high. Um, if this is the best of times, <laughs> at 1.2% or whatever it is, I should have to think, what, well, besides COVID, what the worst of time, what a, a downturn will do. Well, I mean, we've seen a downturn, but we've also seen history in the, in the historical margins of the industry. And we've also seen the historical margins of other players in the industry. Well, for us, especially for African Airlines, um, yes, we're seeing the recovery, uh, but our cost of operations are still extremely high, whether it's, uh, whether it's fuel prices. Yes, fuel prices are going down, but we're still buying fuel at a premium uh, compared to uh, other regions. We have much higher taxes as well, uh, fees, uh, landing fees, navigation, everything. Uh, the cost of uh, operations within the continent is so much higher, which is where a majority of our routes are. Uh, so we are, we are hopeful uh, as we return back to normal, but uh, this needs to, to come down in, in order to, uh, for us to move towards profitability. So we're really watching our costs. Right, let's stay just with you and with Africa for the, for, for the second, because yeah. I hear what you say, but I don't see within Africa any sizable move towards implementing pre-existing open skies, Yamasutra, any That's form um, of <laughs> uh, pan-African flying. I see everybody saying how times have changed, but nothing's really changed. Uh, well, uh, things are changing. It's just they're changing very slowly. Uh, as you talk about the Yamasukro and its various uh, variations, Satam, uh, we've been talking about it for a long time. But I think we've reached a point where uh, we're saying, you know what, let's start with the people who are ready, uh, the coalition of the willing. Le let's, let's start with those uh, who understand the benefits and who, who are ready to really implement all these different measures. And then once everybody sees how well it's working and the benefits, then everybody will jump on board. Uh, otherwise, you're waiting for 54 countries to come to the table. Uh, you'll be waiting for... So where would you start? Time. Where would I start? Uh, we'd start first with um, not only opening the skies, but also opening the borders, because we have a visa issue as well within the African continent, which makes uh, travel within the African continent very difficult. Uh, so while we are talking about uh, allowing fifth freedom, um, having less restrictive buses, we, we should also be talking about uh, the visa regimes within the, within the continent as well. Uh, most of the time, it's easier for somebody coming from outside of uh, the continent to get a visa to a country than an African to get an, a visa to another African country. So we need to see a change in that. Uh, we are seeing some countries coming on board, including Rwanda, which allows visa on arrival for everybody. But that should be the norm rather than the exception. It's painfully slow. It is. It is. It is. <laughs> and I'm angry about that. Sorry? So, I'm angry about that. You're talking about anger, th that I'm angry about. You're because it, it, it is painfully slow, especially given the, the clear benefits of, of right. open skies and open borders and uh, reducing taxes and fees and uh, improving on infrastructure, all that's required to make uh, Af African aviation really take off. John, is it easier to fly things or people? <laughs> I've been on both sides of that equation, so I'll uh, say things. <laughs> in, in what say, in what way? Well, um, particularly with um, the current environment, as I follow it from kind of the outside looking in, all the uh, regulation and so forth that's being considered for passenger um, accommodation uh, when there are delays, um, I think the industry has been, on the passenger side, m maybe this sounds a little too strong, under attack a little bit. Um, I'm not saying that to forgive or ease those controllable things, but um, there's an irony in this all, and that is on the passenger side, there's mutual interest in operating on time, right? The passenger carriers 
are suffering when they're delayed, right? So um, I think the passengers and, and the regulators, they're, they're being heard uh, now more than ever. And so my, I'm empathetic to that, to that situation. Uh, with cargo, there's very little they can complain to. I'm just looking at some, I'm not being rude, I'm looking at some questions that are being texted uh, to me. Let's take this one. Uh, I'm not going to mention names. Um, a question, as a multipolar world order sets in over the next decades, do we foresee more sanctions and double standards in some airlines being able... Now, I mean, this is obviously a, a, a reference to yourself in, 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 um, in the fact that you still fly over Russia, which I'm assuming is, you know, because you can. But as the question says, does, does, how does this fit in? Well, I mean, like all of us, we exist to serve customers and we operate within the ambit of national relationships and, and regulations and diplomatic ties. Uh, and, and so that's what we operate under. Uh, Air India, we operate accordance with the ambit of what's provided to us by the nation of India. Um, not all nations agree. And, and so there are going to be different outcomes as a consequence. I think we've seen over the past few years the consequence of aviation not being able to connect people and economies and cultures and, and support all of the other things that, that we spin off. Um, so, you know, it, it's a sensitive issue, geopolitics, and, and applying geopolitics to the aviation industry that does so much to connect the world, I'm not sure that's a link that should be made. Right, but does, it, does the heart sink in a sense because particularly in a, in a case where you've come from one place and went into another country, this country has a different policy. Let's take Turkey, for example. You know, the example I gave earlier, if I look at the Pegasus flight to Moscow, it goes like that. If I look at the Russian Airlines flight to Moscow, or from Moscow, it goes like that. Well, overflight is only one dimension of, of a very, very complex industry. And I think there's been many discussions over the years about support that some airlines are getting, some are not getting, what level of implicit subsidy, explicit subsidy that, that aviation receives in different parts of the world. So to single out one particular thing, I think uh, this is the, the underlying problem, that it's not a level playing field. It's not a level playing field. Do, do you think one should attempt to make it level? Or do the best you can and thereafter, you know, you, at the end of the day, you have to follow what your government says. Exactly. Look, and it's whether it's uh, climate regulation, whether it's other things. I mean, a key part of IATA's existence is to come up with a level playing field as best we can. Uh, it, it's, it's a, um, it certainly has an impact on our customers. Our business model is we fly for other parties. So if they have to fly around a little longer, there's uh, an irony in that too, in that we get paid more because we get paid by the hour, but that's not good for our customers. So I think in the scheme of things, um, this is it's a tough issue. For, there's the haves and the have nots, depending on the market and where you want to fly to. It's a, it's a difficult issue, but one I think uh, that's important uh, to keep an eye on from a fairness standpoint. But that's just my perspective. If we look at the way in which you are all handling in some shape or form the geopolitical realities of the world, I mean, each has different areas. In which, how difficult is it, Greg? I mean, obviously, it's the, the overflight may not be the big question for you, but, but just geopolitical, do, does your heart sink? when you have to look at these things? I think the answer is, Richard, it depends. And as you said, it's different depending on what part of the world you're in, what sort of business you're in. Um, you know, I think more and more the requirements of us as leaders is to be somewhat ambidextrous in our approach and to learn how to deal with the complexity that some of these things throw at us. Some of the solutions can't be perfect. You have to learn to adapt and accept that um, it may be imperfect for a period of time and to deal with, deal with that without losing sight of what the main objective of this is. But increasingly, these things are going to become difficult. You know, one that 
we're all wrestling with and continue to is carbon emissions. Uh, you know, we, we have a sense of what the answer needs to be. How we solve it okay. is incredibly complex. Right, so I've been asking all CEOs, can you meet the targets? Um, sorry, Yvonne. <laughs> Akbar told me in an interview, no. He says, you are all fooling yourselves that there is no way you can meet the targets 2050 on net zero. And the sooner everybody realizes it, the better. You, you can go last on this. <laughs> um, uh, he says it's just simply not possible because the SAF's not there. It can't be put in place in time. Even if you'd got all the SAF you wanted, you still wouldn't make it. Greg. To be honest with you, Richard, I'm not smart enough to be that definitive. <laughs> what I do know is what other options are there. Um, I'm not prepared to give up on having a shot at something. I like the concept of having some ambition, putting a line in the sand and going for it. We don't have to be so definitive that if we don't get there in this particular year that we're not prepared to extend it out. But at the same time, you've got to be brave enough to have a go at these things. No, I, I, I agree with Greg. Uh, but do you I, think you'll make the target? I, I, to be honest, I don't know, but I think that was very clear when the target was adopted, that there were going to be requirements for technologies and, and other efficiency measures that we would need to develop over the course of time. But absolutely, we're investing in aircraft. We're, I mean, we talk about overflight paths. By mounting non-stop service from India, we are operating a much, much more efficient flight path than by, by transiting via an intermediate hub to the endpoint. So it's going to take many, many things, SAF being one. But as Greg says, we have to try all of these things because clearly the, the objective of a more sustainable industry is, is a desirable one. Well, um, I think that the targets are very, very ambitious, but uh, we, we, do, we do need ambitious targets uh, to, to aspire to. Uh, I know that's diplomatic, but... <laughs> well, I think you're all, I mean, we have a don't know, we have a not sure, and we have ambitious targets. What, what, what phrase will you throw in? I, I will fit into the category of I don't know, but what I do know is that we're going to need the respective governments to play more of a role to help in other areas beyond just SAF, air traffic control, next gen, and so forth. So there needs to be more involvement. Right. So thank you. For, so we basically. No, no, I, I agree. And uh, again, just in the context of uh, African Airlines, when you're talking about SAF, uh, for, for us, we're looking at it as when are we going to get any? And uh, when we do get it, at what cost? Or, or, or as I said before, we're already operating at a much higher cost. Who's, uh, are people willing to pay even more for SAF? Uh, but there, there are definitely other things that we can do in terms of efficiencies as well while we're waiting to get to, uh, to enough SAF for us to be able to afford as well. Uh, so I'm optimistic and hopeful. Uh, oh, we've gone up. Oh, hopeful, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. When I, 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 I don't know whether you were able to hear what Dr. Birrell was saying earlier from the IEA. He basically said that the industry has a problem and it's, or the, 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 one of the issues is you're getting the blame. You've got a reputational crisis for 2% essentially, that's going to get much worse. And unless you start doing something to, com to basically PR, mm -hmm. to get the message out that you are doing something, you're screwed. Now, particularly in New Zealand, Greg, where the environment issue is so insignificant, you must be very aware of that. Do, does the industry need to do more to get that message across? Well, I'm going to just deal with the facts, and the facts, Richard, are that when you live in a country like New Zealand, you really don't have too many options other than air travel. And they just happen to be the facts. You know, you draw a 2,000 kilometre radius around New Zealand, you don't even get to Australia. You draw a 2,000 kilometre radius around Berlin and you can get to Moscow, all of Norway and Sweden the British Isles, in fact, all the way down to Istanbul. So you're going to have to fly in New Zealand, 
people are going to have to travel. They are going to have to connect with one another. For sure, we have a responsibility to do that well. And you're right, there is a risk that the industry does get labelled much harder than many other industries. So let's get the facts out on the table, let the facts be our friends. But at the same time, I go back to my point, that should not stop us setting ambitious targets and doing our best to get there. And I completely agree with you, John. It's going to take the entire ecosystem to get behind it. But go for it. It's a wicked problem. Um, let's try and solve it. But this idea of the reputational damage to the industry. I think people are, at the end, quite sensible and logical about how these things play really? out. Really? Yeah. Because they say to themselves, in a case like New Zealand, how else am I going to get to the United States? A boat takes a long time. Um, so what are we doing to play our part? Appreciating that I still need to connect with people. I've still got a life to lead. I've got, you know, business to transact. So, you know, let's work our way together and solve this problem. Interestingly, from the Indian perspective, of course, uh, very different from the Singaporean perspective, where, of course, it's, it's six freedom foods that are going on and elsewhere, but there's a vast domestic market that hasn't even really been fully tapped by any means. Correct. It's a hugely growing market. It's the third largest aviation market on the planet. The economy is growing at 6 to 8% a year. The demographic profile is very conducive. Uh, we're seeing supply chain realignment, which is further supporting the economy. So, yes, it's a very much growing market, um, but it's a very much underserved market, particularly internationally. Uh, it, it is almost astonishing that India as a whole has less than 50 wide-body aircraft. Really? And so when you see our order of 470 aircraft, of course, 400 of those being narrow-body, it, it sort of puts it into context that it looks like a big order, but relative to the size of the market and the opportunity, and particularly the opportunity to connect India with cities of the world non-stop, more efficient from a climate perspective, um, it, it, it's a significant uh, imbalance that we're trying to address. When you arrived on the first day and you'd worked out where your office was and you know, where the coffee machine and the bathroom was, what did you think? Well, I, I didn't come in without having given some thought in the first place, so it, it wasn't really a surprise. And, I, and, and to be honest, you'll accuse me of being diplomatic. There were more pleasant surprises than, than unpleasant ones. Really? Absolutely. Uh, look, there had been a lot of work done during due diligence and acquisition, and, and the team did a great job. So it wasn't as if there wasn't a roadmap to start with. But there'd been no expenditure on IT. There'd been no uh, exe oh, oh, executive co co um, career deploy. Uh, co correct. There was 15 years in which there had been no recruitment of, of ground-based staff. So there's a big hole in the organization from a succession and capability perspective. Um, we were the last airline in the world on the CETA reservation system. Uh, we were the last company in the world on the SAP ERP mainframe. Uh, people were using, you know, there were thousands of Gmail addresses that people were using in the absence of an effectively functioning company email system. And, and you know, I, I can go through a list, but that's just the nature of an organization that hasn't been invested in over the years. So there's been a lot to fix. But the great thing is that people have been really positive and rallying to the cause. Air India could always recruit great people because they had that cachet. It's just they weren't necessarily invested in or, mm -hmm. or they didn't have the direction. Now with Tata Sun's backing, Tata having founded the airline 90 years ago. Yes, and then, and then bought it back again. <laughs> bought it back again, but with a purpose. With the investment coming in, with a clear direction, with supporting these people, it's amazing what they've done in, in really in a little over a year's time. What will you take as your barometer of success besides, pro besides profitability? Which I agree is a pretty, pretty good barometer. <laughs> well, I, we've been very clear that we want to be regarded as up there with the uh, world's leading airlines in terms of customer experience, obviously in terms of financial performance, in terms of operational reliability, brand reputation. Uh, and, and that will take time. There's, there's a lot of investment that needs to be done. But for all of the reasons I spoke about the India story, and the investment we're making, I think it's possible. Uh, talk about the shortage of pilots and the shortage of, I assume you're all in some shape or form. Now, there's a question from, our, from the audience. 
A huge pilot pay increase is sustainable for the airlines. Will airlines that operate globally have to eventually follow what the US legacy has recently started with large pilot pay increases? Are you finding, well, start with you, sir. Well, there's no doubt there's a war for talent. And um, I think- Oh, you have to pay more? I think you have to, well, that's what carriers have found themselves doing. Um, you see some of the, the high wages that are being offered, no disrespect to uh, the pilots. Uh, they, they earn ev everything they can get, but it has created a challenge. And you have different tiers within the hierarchy of carriers who can, their business models may or may not be able to sustain certain levels of wages, right? And um, so I think you need to take into account the business model, the revenue, um, streams that come in um, as compared to what you can afford to pay because it's too simplistic. Right. But you need them to fly the plane. And if everybody else is paying more, you have to pay more. Well, sure. I mean, that's, that's just basic economics. Right. But, um, at the, there's a reason they have these collective bargaining agreements and supposedly both sides should understand the economics of the business. Um, so it, it's, it's created a difficult situation for the, big, for the big guys who can afford to pay, or maybe not sometimes, but who are paying that, it creates a lot of pressure for the mid-tier regionals and so forth. So. Yvonne, mm -hmm. pilot pay. Yeah, that, that's, uh, that's a major challenge. And f for us, uh, especially the smaller airlines competing with the big guys. And, uh, You're all being very diplomatic. It's a bloody uh, challenge uh, because they're buying your staff. <laughs> they're, they're poaching. <laughs> that's the they, word, poaching. They, 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 they are. Yes, they are. Um, and it's becoming more and more difficult to attract uh, new ones to, to join. Uh, but how we're resolving that is also building local talent, uh, training our own uh, uh, pilots, uh, uh, cadet pilots, and but it, it, that, again, that pipeline takes a while. Um, but for the long term, uh, with the ambitions that we do have, w that, that's the, the route we'll have to take because it's going to get more and more difficult uh, to attract talent. And that happens to you, obviously, as well. Uh, even if, even allowing for an open skies trans-Tasman, because your competitor in Australia is also having the, the problem and risks poaching your staff and vice versa. Or do you have a no poaching? <laughs> we don't, but it is the joys of a cyclical business, isn't it? And uh, at the moment, the cycle is one where we could all probably do with some more pilots as we could with some more planes. But you know what's likely to happen, Richard, is in a reasonably short period of time, it's probably gonna change and um, those are the things that we all have to navigate through. But at the moment, um, generally resources anywhere, not just pilots, but engineers, parts for planes, planes themselves, um, we could all do with some more. That's helping get prices up, which in one way is, is good for us. But as I said, the, the third act is about to come. We're all enjoying the recovery. As we think about costs going forward, I think it's a different environment. So you started New York. We did. Which I, unfortunately I was unable to join you on because the, the Queen passed away, but that's what he did, which is another thing. But you started New York and now, bugger, Qantas is doing it or starting it from Sydney to Auckland to New York. They're stealing your clothes. Well, there aren't too many routes actually, Richard, that any of us fly where someone isn't also on that route. So oh, come on. That's we a, welcome them. We're, a bit, <laughs> we're not even a little bit pissed off. <laughs> not really. Um, we're pretty confident in our product. We've got a good product. You know, in a year's time, you're going to be able to fly with us economy and be able to lie flat. And I know you'll be looking forward to that. <laughs> Would you? I will certainly do it. I'll be happy to do it with you. So, so do I, I, I feel a challenge coming on here. <laughs> I'm up for it, are you? <laughs> oh, don't do this. <laughs> Economy. Economy. Sky Nest. How many, hours, only how many hours do we get in the Sky Nest? You're only allowed four hours, Richard, and you're not allowed to bring a friend. <laughs> Those are the rules. Nesticate, it's called. The Nesticate rule. Yep, and you got to, you can, got to Come take, on. take you're, your you're, shoes off. You're delusional. It's going to become, can I bonk 
in the nest. Can, can I bonk in the nest without anybody noticing? Now, as I said to you, we do have rules, nest etiquette, and you're not allowed to take a friend, but you are allowed to make it your home for that four hours. And there's no munching, crunching, or eating your lunch in there. <laughs> and you do need to take your shoes off. But you're going to have fun. And I'll look... Somehow, he's <laughs> taken munching, crunching, and you can't bring a friend. And he says, I'm going to have fun. <laughs> you will, trust me. <laughs> Would you do it? Of course. I've done it. You and I have done economy class on a long trip. Once. <laughs> mm. yeah. I, I'm, I'm not sure about that one. <laughs> really. <laughs> Why not? No. No. Look, this. I have to get uh, full credit to you. The innovation that your airline has shown, at both the front and at the back, is legendary. Both with the cuddle couch or the whatever you, the, the official name for that contraption is, that was a really clever way of screwing more money out of people for basically bringing the seat up. But it was very clever, very clever. And now the the, um, the sky nest, very cleverly done. What are you going to innovate? Goodness, I think uh, we've got a little bit to go before we start really innovating. We need to get up to a, a certain standard. But uh, I, can rest, I can tell you for sure that we will be innovating in time to come. It's all, in all classes? Well, I, I think you look at the history of Air India, 1960s, 1970s, you know, the, the, the in-flight experience was second to none. And whilst the world has changed and, and cabin interiors have changed since then, uh, that is clearly the heritage that we're trying to bring back. And so that will require investment, it will require innovation, but it's, it, it, it's the passion. How difficult is it to innovate? Well, it is difficult um, because a lot of things have already been done already. Um, and for, uh, for a lot of airlines now, uh, the focus is really to get things back to normal before moving right. to the next step of innovation. So it, it's a bit of a challenge for us. We're really focused on how we can bring back uh, everything to pre-pandemic levels and then give a, a superior customer experience uh, thereafter. But we're working towards that and we're looking forward to, to bringing in some interesting innovations. Oh, come on. N nothing for now, but uh, yeah, interesting watch the space. Uh, I'm yeah. going to watch it. Right. Yeah. Questions, anybody got a question? Oh, that, was that, was <laughs> that, that was fast. That was fast. And, and I'll, I, I'll, oh, hang on a second. Any more, by the way, it, it is plus one, nine, one, seven, three, nine, 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 zero, six, three. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, I'm Charles Schlumberger from the World Bank. We saw the numbers. America, Europe, tons of profit. But Africa, Latin America, still many airlines lose a lot of money. In the last 10 years, specifically in Africa, we saw the re-emergence of many state-owned carriers with two, three aircrafts protect their markets, and they cost millions. And when the IMF goes and asks the Minister of Finance, they are told connectivity is so important. We need to do it. Let's assume you're retired. You become a consultant. <laughs> you're in one of these countries and talk to the government. What would you advise a government? to do with the airline that cost millions. What would you advise? <laughs> My personal advice usually is liquidate and recreate as a private operator. But that's not possible everywhere. Cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly what has happened in <laughs> India. Yeah. <laughs> Air India was government owned, it's now been privatized. It now has the capital and, and the... Has it really? I mean, it's been privatized, yes. yes. But has it really been privatized? Absolutely, 100%. So that would imply that the government would let it fail? Absolutely. The government has let other airlines in India fail. Well, for, for Rwanda, the government cannot afford for the airline to fail. Um, it's the only airline, and Rwanda is a landlocked country. So uh, this is very important for the development of the country. But what the government has done in terms of supporting the airline is to support it to get to a level where it's attractive for other investors, which is why we have uh, the partners coming in. 
We have an interesting scenario, Richard. We have 51% owned by the government, 49% is, uh, is open to other people to participate in. You know, as I mentioned before, the shared geography of New <coughs> Zealand is such that the role of the airline is critical. Our job is to connect New Zealanders, Kiwis, with one another. You know, we don't have a high-speed rail network. It's a large country, New Zealand, um, in terms of the size of geography, and, but it's sparse in terms of population. So the roading network is not great. Air travel is often uh, the best way for people to get around. So we have a responsibility, both domestically and internationally, particularly around cargo. Mm. So having some government support there makes sense, but at the same time, you've got to be commercially viable. And so we hold ourselves to account. The government holds us to account to return a profit, to return an investment on that capital. And that's exactly what we get on and do. And of course, you co you, your, your, your principal competitor from next door has, ro has root rights to and from New Zealand, yes. which, as we discovered from New York, eats into your... Yeah, and I think that's a good thing, isn't it? Is because it? competition makes you better. So I'm quite you know, relaxed about the fact that we have to get out there and compete. I've spent my entire life before I joined an airline in a market which is open, retail, people get in there, you're only as good as the last customer you served, and that's what I expect us to be in our airline. So I welcome competition and you survive based on the product that you deliver. Now, from the luxury of the vantage point of cargo mm -hmm. and freight, would you let the airlines just go? Do you believe that if there's no rationale, you just go? Well, <clears throat> I think market forces should prevail. I think on the question here, uh, not, I'm not sure about the liquidate part, but certainly the privatized part and let it see how it goes and um, to the point just made, competition will prevail. Right, and I'm not talking about the pandemic situation sort of thing right. where everybody, you'd have been liquidating the whole bloody lot of you. Uh, you'd have all been out of business. Here's a question, which I think we need to be a little bit, just a little bit careful uh, on company. You, uh, um, how do airlines aim to cut costs, increase revenues, improve margins, while the industry's core businesses is still based on 1960s technologies and distribution modes? <laughs> now, since you are the one who came into an, a, an airline that's closer to the 1960s modes of technology, you take it first. Oh, goodness gracious, that's, <laughs> a, that's a wide question. Um, look, it, aviation is about unit cost and unit revenue. Yeah, and, and, and unit cost is about efficient equipment operating efficiently with good IT systems, efficient contracts, strong distribution, good product, reliability. I mean, it, it sounds simple, but the devil is in the detail. Um, I, there's no magic bullet here. Oh, very similar to oh. what, <laughs> what Campbell has said, really. Um, uh, well, um, it, especially in terms of distribution, we're getting uh, new, right. new, better methods of distribution, so we, we should see some, some uh, savings on, on, on that side. Um, some, of, some of the things are really out of our hands, uh, especially the huge cost centers, fuel, maintenance, uh, especially now, uh, which is a challenge. So we, we try and control what, what is within our, uh, our control, really. Um, so there are opportunities. Yes, it's difficult. Uh, the models are still old, but there, there, there is opportunities right. with the new, uh, with technology, especially. Question from Adam. Yes, ma'am, the lady. At the front, can you just shout, or we've got a microphone that we can? Can we, can we get a microphone to that nice lady? Oh, I'm sure you can, <laughs> man, but there's no need to. <laughs> Go ahead, you shout away. Um, hi, I'm Dina Kamel. I'm a journalist from the National in Abu Dhabi. Um, just a question to the panel in general. There's been a lot of talk about how AI technologies like chat. GPT and others are changing various industries, so I'm wondering if I can get your thoughts on whether it will change the way that you do business, um, how people search for travel, um, and so on. And then a quick second question, if I may. Um, any thoughts on um, the new Chinese uh, plane maker, Comac, and ah. uh, how you see 
Um, how do you see that playing out in the future as a viable competitor right. to the duopoly? Excellent question. We've got 470 aircraft coming. I think we'll digest those ones first. Um, well, not, not right now, but uh, we, we can wait and see uh, how it plays out, but uh, maybe not right now. Let's see what happens. Um, I, would, I would not... I'm not smart enough to say never, but um, let the thing run its course and just see how that develops out. I'm retiring in two <laughs> weeks. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. <laughs> and? <laughs> I, I, similar to what I said before, I think market forces will prevail. All right. uh, at the end of the day, I would support or whatever the market right. determines. So AI, let me start with the question I asked the last panel. Do you see an existential, before you answer whether you've used ChatGPT, do you see an existential threat from AI? I, I'm not, I'll take Greg's line, I'm not smart enough to know. Um, I'm really not sure. Uh, yes. I think it is a, um, one of the most significant things that will happen in my lifetime. Um, you know, as I think about some of the developments over the last sort of 10 to 20 years where we've, you know, got into discussions about blockchain, virtual reality, augmented reality, artificial intelligence, it feels to me the one that is likely to create the greatest change is artificial intelligence. Um, as I think about also where quantum computing goes, um, these are significant shifts that are occurring faster than anything that I have ever seen. I'm not sure how it all plays out, Richard, but um, not all of it will be, will be good. A lot of it will be. How it all plays out in airlines is yet, you know, we, we, we're only at the beginnings of it, but it's significant. I, I, and the fascinating part about it and is it's this contradiction that you all face. We all face, not, not you, everybody faces. That we know it's, it's, we know it's coming, we know it's going to be very big, we know we have to have it. But how the hell do we have it and not bring the house down round our ears at the same time? Yeah, uh, you know, I want to go back to, to the question you put before in terms of, you know, you've got costs going up and, and you know, revenues under pressure as capacity comes back. You know, when I think about businesses that I like dealing with, and um, th there are two that actually come to mind who I think have changed their approach and, and how they deal with customers. You know, one of them is Apple and the other one is Amazon. Is, yeah, they're easy to deal with. You know, you you don't tend to have to argue and debate and you know do all kinds of things that you do normally if things go wrong or you have to change something. Airlines are bloody difficult to deal with. You know, when you disrupt passengers or you're dealing with refunds and all of those things. Part of what is going to have to happen, I think, in order for us to deal with some of the complexity that's coming at us, is to rethink and simplify how we deal with customers. And part of that is, is how you work, how you think about your business and how you operate. Um, you know, we tend to be quite siloed right. in our approach and we have our network teams and we, you know, we have our engineering teams and we have our pilots and whatever we don't tend to think like some of these businesses like Apple and Amazon do, where they work as well horizontally as what they do vertically. But most importantly, before they worry about that, the most important person is the customer. And what they do all the way through is that they look to simplify the role for the customer. And a lot of that comes down to self-service. And that's really what customers want more and more, the ability to solve things themselves in a very seamless and simplified fashion. 
Now, the advantage that digital plays in this, and AI is part of this, is it allows you to do some of this at a lower cost. And that's the part that we've got to get into. Well, if you go to airindia.com now and go to the Maharaja chatbot, it's a GPT-4 powered chatbot. Yeah, but we'll answer the question. Because well, chat, I mean, I'm not being yes. disrespectful, but chatbots are the most infuriating <laughs> when actually what I want is a phone number or a real human being because it's a more tricky question. Yes, but it needs to evolve. And, and it needs to evolve to be able to answer the question that you, you want answered, not just give you a link, not just give you a phone number that you then have to ask someone else and explain your problem. We're at the, the beginning of this journey, but the fact is that it exists, it will lower unit cost, it will improve service, it will become much more customer centric, but clearly it's something that we, we all have to start experimenting with because it's here. I want to finish with perspective, because you each come with a very different perspective. So we have you, sir. You come from SQ, very, um, well, we all know SQ and its, uh, it's, it, it, its philosophy and its vi vi vision. And you now go to Air India, which could not be more in opposite direction if you sat and how do you, how do you stay sane, but also how do, how do you manage that in your perspective? Because you can't just, you would be the first to tell me if you have, you can't just take the SQ <laughs> mentality <laughs> and put it on SQ. You'll go mad. No, it, and you shouldn't do that either because it's, a, it's its own culture, it's its own country, it has its own history, it, it, it has its own strengths and, and other areas. And look, Indian hospitality is renowned. I think if we put the right product, the right service, the right technology with an Indian heart, it, it, it doesn't need to be the same as someone else. It can be just as good, but different. But is it, ex but it's very, it is, I'm not asking, it's, I'm, I'm saying, it's extremely exciting for somebody in your position to be taking essentially a startup on a vast scale. Look, it, it, it's the most interesting and exciting aviation job in the world, with all due respect to everyone else that has aviation jobs. Because you're taking a 90-year legacy, you're taking a country's hopes and dreams, 1.3 billion people with their own ideas and hopes and dreams for this airline, uh, and you're merging four airlines into, into two and transforming the industry. I, I think it's, there is no better place to be in aviation. It's not the easiest place to be, but no better place. Ivan, mm -hmm. first of all, there's a lot more, there's, well, not a lot more, I'm overstating, female CEOs. I, I see. <laughs> Definitely not a lot more. No, there are, not, but there are more. <laughs> more. There are more female CEOs. So yeah. you're not a, you're, you're not the obligatory female CEO that uh, I, I, in that sense. But do you feel change? Can you feel change? Uh, yes, yes, I, I, I do. From when I joined the industry, I was telling somebody uh, my first AGM was in Sydney, and I walked in. Somebody coming from Rwanda, where women empowerment is like top of the agenda, we, we have the highest representation of female parliamentarians and the cabinet is over 50%. So walking into that environment and just seeing all these gray suits and uh, it, it was, oh, yeah, <laughs> it, was, it was really overwhelming. But now we're, uh, we're starting to see some changes. Uh, it needs to move faster, I believe. Uh, but we are seeing uh, changes and we're seeing uh, the fact that people recognize that there is a problem and uh, there's more people are more intentional, intentional in terms of addressing this issue of diversity. You join this industry, Greg, and there must be moments when you think this makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> this is a completely barking mad group of people that could not make money selling water in the desert. I'm not going to uh, swallow that grenade, Richard, but <laughs> thanks for throwing it my direction. <laughs> I will say that, that starting on the day that sort of COVID got underway in New Zealand was um, not in the job description anywhere, but you get on with it. And, um, you know, this is a, is a very complex ecosystem. That's something that I've come to appreciate. Um, airlines really is quite complex. And is it more complex than you thought? Yes. I think as a, as a customer, you don't appreciate all the moving pieces and the requirement to get so many of these dominoes lined up 
to, you know, to create the right experience. You know, think about it. You've got a, a couple of hundred million dollars of planes sitting somewhere or other. You've got to, you know, get a couple of hundred things all connected at the right time so you can push that plane back from a gate. You might then fly it for 16 hours and land within a couple of minutes of the scheduled time, 16 hours later with everything intact. And you're doing that hundreds of times a day. So it is quite complex. Um, what we've got to do is use technology even more and keep our people engaged to deliver an even better experience for our customers. You get the last word, sir. I, I, th I think my perspective is confidence in the future. Oh, no, 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 no. Both on the air side and on the cargo side. Now, why are you retiring? We've gone through some trials. Why traumas. are you retiring? Yeah, yeah, no, but uh, well, I'm retiring from Atlas, so uh, that, you know. Oh, so you're going on to something else? Always looking for something else, you know, but. Anybody uh, got a job that they want to, <laughs> want, <laughs> but, like uh, to offer? Him. I mean, the man's available from two weeks. <laughs> he's already told us he's available in yeah. two weeks. But. Um, Do you have copies of your resume? Um, <laughs> People know who I am, but no, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, but in all seriousness, if you look at the data, and yes, the industry has gone through traumas over time, but it's a resilient industry. I agree with what was just said in terms of leveraging technology. This industry has always persevered, always tried to make the best, and that has created an upward trajectory, and the data stands behind that. Do you still, do you still watch a plane take off and think, how the hell does it do it? Especially a 747, and I loved your video at the beginning where you identified that Atlas took the last 747 ever built, the queen of the skies, to watch a 747 take off or land anywhere is just something I, I never get tired of. And I think that's generally true of all aviation, so it's, I was it's an amazing. I staggered when I looked at your fleet and how many you've got. Yeah. Yeah, we're the world's largest operator, 74s, and we took the last four and, and proud of it. So uh, that's not to say there aren't other great airplanes. The 777 is going to be a great airplane. Well, stop being diplomatic. Yeah, yeah, but <laughs> just you know. leave it there. You asked for my resume, so I'm. You know. <laughs> ah, <laughs> just in case there's anybody else. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> our panel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.